When did you join and when did you get out? 2011 to 2013. Listen, bike clubs are misunderstood. Yeah. For the most part, bikies join bike clubs to ride bikes and enjoy the brotherhood. If you're a commo, you're independent still. If you have a problem, they expect you to sort your own problem out. Okay. They're not going to all rally together like a football team and say, let's go and get them. Yeah. It's like, okay. you got a problem, go fucking sort it out, mate. Yeah. You know, if you can't sort it out, why, why are you part of us? We'd heard a whisper that there was going to be an ambush. Right. I hadn't left yet. Yeah. And they go, what do we do? I said, what do you mean? They said, there could be an ambush. And I said, yeah. What do we do? I said, we fucking go, bro. What do you think we're going to do? If it get, kicks off, it kicks off. How did you manage family? Did you have in a relationship at the time? Family came first, bro. Family came first. Yeah. If you didn't have your family support and didn't have a job, yeah. you're no good to me, mate. If you can't pay your dues, fuck off. He loved me, this guy. Because he had a lot of issues with, not only with villains, but also with people in the industry. So then you know, it got to a stage where no one could communicate. I was allowed to call him. They had to call me. And right. I would decide whether I'm going to let you talk to him or not. Can I bring up Wayne Snyder? For a long time, they wanted him dead. He survived all that. Yeah, so I met Wayne a few times and he migrated to Thailand. Come out of the gym, walk to my car, open the door, jump in. Both legs are in the car and the door's still open. And the bomb goes off. The pedals break my feet. Yeah. But apart from that... You know, it's a bit of fire, a bit of burning, nothing to brag about. All right, tough guy. <laughs> in the underworld. Yeah. I fucking know a lot of people. Yeah. And I didn't die, so maybe it was just a warning. The I Catch Killers podcast was a fresh start for me, as I left policing behind and started a new life. Over the years, we've laughed together, cried, and shared some powerful moments. Welcome to I Catch Killers. Welcome back to part two of my chat with Jay Malcolm, a former heroin trafficker, a bikey, an underworld fixer and a family man. If you listen to part one, we found out a bit about Jay's crazy life, how he built a business, did 10 years in prison, a sentence that he believes made him come out a better person. Now we're going to talk about his life post-prison. Jay Malcoon, welcome back to I Catch Killers. Thanks. Okay, so we've uh, in part one, we were talking that uh, you got out of prison, you felt 12 foot tall. You had uh, a fortunate uh, situation where eight hundred eighty thousand dollars was owing to you. One hundred eighty. Uh, One hundred eighty. Wish it was eight hundred eighty. Oh, yeah, Would have got my holidays. <laughs> yeah, you, you wouldn't be, be here. Still spending it. Um, and also, you uh, you became a uh, promoter for an, an opera singer and all sorts of things. Hmm. I'm looking at your life there, and I, I'm looking at your life through what I was uh, reading in your book, The Consultant, which is a, a great uh, great read. Recommend it to uh, anyone that wants to get a real understanding of the world we're talking about now. But I didn't pick you at that point in time. There was an independence about you. I didn't pick you the type of uh, guy to go into uh, an OMCG. And, <laughs> uh, to, to me, like I, uh, I, I see the pathway that people yeah. going into OMCG and you know, they're, they're kicking around, they're at a bit of a, a loose end and uh, they, they want to feel part of a brotherhood, which mm. I'm Tom and Chero's. How, how did you, what attracted you to it? I, I, I would never thought myself in a club. Yeah. I mean, when we were growing up, the bikers were old school bikers mm. and this is something I was not attracted to. Did nothing. They didn't fly the flag from where I lived, like the opposite to what we expected. Yeah. And um, I met I met the guys, the hierarchies, and uh, mate, they were. I was instantly attracted to them. Right. It was something I'd not exp- I'd not seen for a long time. You said you met with the uh, the upper leaders. Yeah, the leaders and uh, champion blokes, like proper. Yeah. Like proper, and they were they were united. They were a brotherhood. Yeah. And they they all they all ran the ball. There was no there was no shyness amongst any of them. Mm. And they had so much respect for each other. It was like, it's the way it should be. I don't know how it is in other clubs, but in this particular club, this is why they grew so strong so quick because they were, they were united and they were capable and they were fucking willing, bro. Yeah, yeah. You know, in this environment, bike world, you know, there's always going to be a degree of violence and, yeah, you know. So these guys handled it, and um, so things were happening in Melbourne. So you on on that, and we'll, we'll, we don't need to name names, but uh, yeah, a couple of things. I understand the language, but uh, run the ball. These were people that would step up if they needed to step up, and that's something that you respected. Bro, they would they would step up instantly. Yeah, like there's no shyness. <laughs> yeah, there's no let's talk about this. Let's see how we're going to go. Can we go this way? Can, it was like fuck that. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, they 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 but they were all like that. When yeah. I say all, the ones that I'd met, yeah, they were very cool individuals. Right, it's very hard to resist that 
I mean, I just I was incarcerated for ten years. I met all sorts. Yeah, yeah. Individuals, you know, in, individuals that was were equally as yeah, you know, hectic. And and being attracted to that, I think it would be fair to say. And I, I don't think ego is necessarily a, a, a a bad thing, but it would be stroking your ego being part of a group or wanted Absolutely, to be into right. that. So. These guys were monsters in the industry. It ramped it up. Yeah. But yeah, getting getting back to what it attracts you. And, and I, I think if people are honest, there is an ego because the alpha male, you're part of a gang, a very yeah big Familiar. game. You, yeah. you walk somewhere, you're part of the gang. You, you give them respect, whether it's in a club. If you're a commo mm. and uh, you're independent still, if you have a problem, they expect you to sort your own problem out. Okay. They're not going to all rally together like a football team and say, let's go and get them. Yeah, it's like, okay. you got a problem, go fucking sort it out, mate. Yeah. You know, if you can't sort it out, why, why are you part of us? Because we can sort our shit out. Okay. So the, well, they weren't there to lend a hand and help you step up and do your shit. You sort your own fucking shit out. All right. Now, they were looking at, uh, or they had a, a chapter set up down in, in Melbourne. Yeah. And that's a, what uh, you went to? Yeah, no. But you, the, didn't, you didn't go as a norm or a, a, a... No. So I met the guys a couple of times. They really liked me. They knew about me. Yeah. They'd heard a few things. They did their, their due diligence, and they offered me a role. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. It was hard to resist. Yeah. You know, when you got, like, I had so much respect for these guys. Yeah. You know, yeah. For, for for their achievements and what they're capable of. Yeah. Asking to jump on, I was like, sure. Okay. Let's do it. Now you uh, you rose rapidly to be the president of the uh, Victorian. I was sergeant for two weeks, and then uh, got promoted to Victorian president. In the cops, we have some resentment where people rise too rapidly. Was there anyone? Uh, was there anyone going? What the fuck? How, how did you? Uh, how did you achieve that? Because that is a fast path. I don't think they'll surprise in Victoria. Yeah. I don't know about Sydney. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you know, it was inevitable, bro. There's no fucking nomination issue. Yeah. It's either put me up top or don't worry about it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. That fair. Fair call. I see it, and I'm saying this in a, you know, a, a half joking but half serious way. It would be a stressful role trying to manage, uh, uh, manage or lead a uh, outlaw motorcycle gang. In that, they're yeah. wild, wild guys. You're going to have to keep them in line. So when I say stressful, there'd be a lot of work that you got to do to keep them, uh, keep them in line. I see. I, I, I took a page out of Maktoum's book. Okay. Yeah. You know, I had. Uh, we ended up with three chapters, nearly four, and a lot of members. And uh, I made all the decisions, mate. Okay. I didn't allow them to make decisions. Right. And none of the presidents, no one. So we'd have our weeklies. I'd chair yeah. all the meetings. And we'd, you know, we'd lay it all out and I'd let them have a pretend vote and just tell them how it's going to be. <laughs> okay. So we don't... Problem with bike clubs and when you're dealing with multiples, mm. not all of them are sensible. Most of them just want to have fun. Yeah. And they'll do silly sort of things like vote to have our national run yeah. At the clubhouse until ten, then all go to the strippers. Three hundred members. Uh, that, that's going to which cause is what problems. happened. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. No consideration of, you know, what what could the possible outcome be? Who's going to get arrested? You know, who's going to be? Who's going to get fucking hurt? Well, it, it's if if they do that, it's inevitable that shit's going to go down. And uh, yeah. Well, so they had that problems. meeting in my absence, and that's what yeah. they voted. So clearly, I sorted that out. Yeah, yeah. But that's is why I ran. I made all the decisions, mate. Okay. How how was that? Uh, did they fall in the line? People fell in the line. It wasn't optional. Yeah, you, you have to lead. Yeah, with aggression. Right. Otherwise, you're not going to be respected. Because I I let you know that if there's a crack or a weakness, somebody will have a crack. Yeah. So you know you just got to stay on top of all that. Okay. You have to be feared. Yeah. I mean, look, there's one. or well, there's a few members in a few clubs that are the alphas, and that's because they're fucking feared, and yeah. for good reason. Yeah. You know, you know how it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know how it is. I, yeah. I think, and it's I, personally, I love hearing this because I, I know that is that is the world, and uh, quite often people don't speak so op openly. So, yeah. yeah, that that is the world that I under understood that uh, the way it uh, way it operated. So, you enjoyed the role. I enjoyed it for a minute. Yeah, it was good when we were small, and then we grew, and it became you know. It's still manageable, but it became it started becoming hard work. Yeah, like you said, the more you have to people you have to manage, the more issues that. And plus, like, you know, I had uh, members that were just below me. Yeah, that were that were younger and ambitious, and it was time for them to step up. They yeah. wanted to step up, yeah. and it was it was actually their time. Succession planning. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd I'd planned my retirement for six months. Right. 
So it wasn't something I just decided to do. And I had discussed that with the hierarchy for over a six month period. Yeah. And the, the person that was going to take over, he was keen to take over. And he, you know, he was the man for the job. A, a, cu- a couple of things, and I, I'm not delving into uh, in the, the bikey world, but you, you made a point there that, uh, yeah, as it got bigger, it, it, it got harder to, to manage because you're um, bringing people in. I know with clubs, and this is just my observation from where I was sitting on the, on the other side, that when there was recruitment and they brought a lot of people in, there was more problems because they were bringing dickheads in and uh, all, all sorts of things. I'm not talking con no, no, chairs, I'm talking, talking general. But when there's an expansion yep. and uh, they're not vetting people, that's where uh, you, you see people come unstuck. We also get the ones that want to hide in a club because they're up to the nefarious activities, yeah, you know, yeah. whatever they're doing, so they need a bit of protection. Yeah. They come on as good blokes and they're just using the club for protection. Yeah. So it's hard to, well, you've got to wear through all that shit. When it does happen, they get through. Yeah. And it's easy to be a good bloke for a short period of time, convince someone that you're, you're all that. You I've, had, I've had blokes, we had one bloke in the system that one of the sergeants from another chapter brought in yeah. and uh, he'd convinced him, he was coming to Sydney. He'd convinced the boys here that he was a fucking proper gangster. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like a mad killer, right? I go, who him? They go, yeah. And then I wanted to get him because he was talking out of school. So I sent that sergeant out to find him. He couldn't find him. Yeah. And I got really fucking cranky. So I got my boys to find him. They found him in fucking 10 minutes, mate. They said, we've got him. He's down here, down Greenvale. I said, sit off him. I'm on my way. So I jumped in the car, flew down there. He's Jerry, and he drove into the police station. Yeah. Right, he's parked in the front. So I rang the boys in Sydney. I said, "Get him on the phone. Put him on a two-way." <laughs> they soon discovered he's just a fucking weak dog. That, uh, that but was, they get in. Yeah. They sneak through the cracks. Oh well, yeah. Uh, uh, in any walk of life, and I, I found that interesting that your book talking about the world in uh, bikies, but it, it's corporate world. There's a lot of things. It's a police organisation. There's a whole thing, a whole lot. And some of the stuff, you could almost do a leadership talk. And it, it's a strange uh, a strange form of leadership uh, leading a, a outlaw motorcycle gang. But there were issues that arise in any, any organisation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just dealing with personalities, aren't you, really? Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Uh, uh, Ego's personalities and uh, then the people undermining. And I, I saw where you had people undermining you. And oh, they have a crack. Yeah, yeah. You got to deal with it. Most definitely. Yeah. I, I think if you don't deal with people undermining, and I'm not talking just um, bikies here, I'm talking any organisation. In my own experience in the cops, I underestimate the people that were undermining me. I'm thinking they're just useless, um, lazy pricks that I don't really care about. But when they spend their whole time uh, trying to fuck you, yeah, 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 they can they can do some damage. Absolutely. The old saying: "One uh, rotten apple spoils a crate." Yeah. Very much so. Very much so. Yeah, well, this this particular individual yeah. caused a problem. Yeah. So we were on our run to Sydney, and um, we'd heard a whisper that there was going to be an ambush. Right. I hadn't left yet. Yeah. Because I, I stayed back. I'd catch up with you guys in Albury the next morning. Yeah. And they go, "What do we do?" I said, what do you mean? They said, there could be an ambush. I said, yeah. What do we do? I said, we fucking go, bro. What do you think we're going to do? If it kicks off, it kicks off. So we, <laughs> we went and, uh, you know, we gave it a bit of a nudge and, well, nothing happened, obviously. Right. It's just a fucking rumour. Now, leaving, you, you had a succession plan. Six uh, uh, six months, you, you know the fight. People's perception, you join, you can never leave. A, a lot of clubs are like that. Yeah. They own you. Yeah. Commos aren't like that. I mean, like in my experience, they're just such cool individuals, mate. I mean, no, I don't want any negative impact on them. Yeah. Um, but you know, they're um, they're just. It's hard to put your finger on it. Coming from my background, for you, you probably wouldn't appreciate it. From my background, violence, incarceration, drugs. Yeah. Uh, seeing these guys and the way they 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 held themselves and carried themselves and what their willingness. And the brotherhood was like, fuck, give me some of that. Yeah. And, no, and you want me? I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you bought, bought in a bit of uh, style too, the fashion sense. What, oh, no, they were fashionable. They were about them. Yeah. They were driving the G-Wagons and the Lamborghinis. You know, my car wasn't that lumpy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You've, uh, and you probably, so when did you join and when did you get out? Rough, rough figures. 211 to 213. Okay. Yeah. yeah, when you you joined, so in there for uh, the two, two years. Two years. Yeah. Yeah. Not in Melbourne. Melbourne yeah. was pretty cool. But uh, people were going down to Melbourne to get away from. Uh, Didn't matter. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, the the states run differently in Victoria. I don't know how it's run here. I still haven't got my yeah. head around it. But the I mean, the police are the police there, and they they don't fuck around, bro. Yeah. I mean, they you know they do the job. Yeah. They do it effectively. You fuck up, we catch you. We're going to put you in jail. If we don't catch you, we'll catch you eventually. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how it runs here, but the they're not the police aren't scared in Melbourne. I'm not suggesting they're scared here. <laughs> I like I like your attitude, Jay. I like <laughs> like your attitude. But I see his point. I mean, if you're going to play up and you're going to wear your colours, you're putting a target on your back. Yeah, yeah. But listen, the bike clubs are misunderstood. Yeah. For the most part, bikies join bike clubs to ride bikes and enjoy the brotherhood. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're going to get a percentage that want to play up and you're going to get another smaller percentage that are hugely successful playing up and they're high, you know, some hide in clubs and some don't give a fuck about the club. They're mm. just, they've inherited the club. But most bikers just want to ride bikes, man. Yeah. I remember when my, all my members, most of them, worked, had families, and couldn't afford too much time for the bike club. I, I was gonna uh, gonna say when uh, when you were in the the bike club, like uh, you know the uh, gang comes first. How did you manage family? Did you have in a relationship? Gang didn't at come the first, time? bro. Family came first. Yeah. If you didn't have your family support and didn't have a job, yeah, you're no good to me, mate. If you can't pay your dues, fuck off. Okay. It's fifty bucks a week. Someone's oh. got to pay the rent. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So family first. If you didn't have stability and you weren't employed, you were going to be a problem. Yeah. So that's how I perceived it. So all my, my guys worked. You're running a chapter. This is your turf. We're, we're recording in Erskineville. This is your turf. Someone from a rival gang moves in too close. How, how do you, in your negotiating <laughs> skills, manage, uh, uh, manage well, that, a That happened to us like twice. Well, the, how did you manage that? Well, just had to, you know, like, Gonna move on, bro. <laughs> you just said, "Excuse me, we're here." No, no. How, well, this how, is the thing. We were there first, yeah. And I knew both presidents, and they're both good blokes yeah. from different teams. And the first one, he didn't know we were there, and like I said, the other three guys didn't do it. They didn't fly the flag, so they had a a, a clubhouse next to a a transvestite massage parlor. That's not a good look. No, <laughs> it was more of a garage that they never attended. They never rode. Yeah. Never wore their colours. No one knew they existed. Yeah. So this fellow went and opened up a clubhouse literally two blocks down the road. So when I told him we were here, he was surprised. But he respected that we were there first. Okay. So he's like, you got to move, you got to move, bro. Yeah. Uh, and I said, let me give me give me an hour, I'll go get the president, we'll talk about it. They're probably one of the only ones that took a proper shot at the commas and almost got a few of them. Yeah. The car was riddled in bullets. There was a proper ambush. Not to be fucked with. You need to come and talk to this guy and let's work it out. Yeah. I'll work it out, but you need to be present. I said, ah, oh, I'm taking my missus shopping to Coles. <laughs> Can you deal with it? Oh, that's, uh, yeah. So, this is kind of, is it a leader? But Not went, much respect there. So I went back and saw the other fellow. I said, listen, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Just up the road there is Port Melbourne. There's plenty of fucking factories. It's another suburb. Yeah. I'll pay the bond. I'll take the rent that you've paid already, and you can just go up the road. And that was the agreement we made. Yeah. So I succeeded in taking the clubhouse off at another club. So when Dax came out to see this cunt, the clubhouses, he wanted to meet me after. I said, how'd you go? He goes, yeah, good, bro. I said, what do you think? He goes, oh, he only showed him the, the transvestite one. He goes, oh, you're just starting out. You know, you, you'll get on your feet. Said, what do you mean? He goes, you know. I said, He was it? hiding what you had done. He didn't yeah. tell him. Right, okay. That's when I threw the towel in. I said, that's what happened? I said, yeah, bro. He didn't tell you. I said, no. He was fucking thrilled that it happened because he was one of the ones that got ambushed. Yeah. And he goes, oh, mate, I said, listen, he's, I'm just going to drop the colours off now. <laughs> I don't want to play this game. He goes, no, no, you stay. He's got to go. So they tipped him. Okay. And that's how. That's how I became president in two weeks. Right. And rightly so. Yeah. Well, it's. Uh... He went shopping to Coles. I look. Completely different world, but I know in uh, in the cops, if, I, if I'm running a job, I expect, uh, no. What do you mean you can't work this weekend? The job's on. We've got to, yeah. got to do it. So it, uh, it happens. But uh, no, you're giving us a, an interesting insight. But you got out. You got out of uh, got out of the uh, the gangs. And then uh, is that the period of time where you uh, you wanted to distance yourself from everything here, and you went over and lived in Dubai? Was and I was working for a, a couple of mining companies. Yeah, and I was making really good money. Tell us about tell us about that again. You don't have to break it down specifics, but where does the money come from working for your type of skills and background? Uh, predominantly from, well, I was protecting one particular guy, uh, just from 
other villains. Yeah. And um, but when you do mediation for them, like a partnership dissolves, particularly when they were dividing everything up. And there was one company that was worth a lot of money yep. still, and they were arguing about it. And the other guy got the bikies involved from right. Perth. Okay. And I happened to be in London when this was all happening. And I was offered the job of um, getting the guys to drop off and let them deal with it in court. And for that, I was paid 8 million shares, or half of 16, and 8 million opposite. The shares are worth probably five, five and a half million bucks. And um, other things. And cash. <laughs> a lot of cash. I whisper in the microphone, I can still hear. A lot of cash. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I did the job. Yeah, okay. It took 10 minutes. And, uh, that's and, how I and so that was your role in mediating. You, you've okay. Well, we could go to war on this, or yeah, uh, uh, it could get ugly. Or nah, but listen, listen. This is the thing. People know me. Yeah. All right. So the people I was dealing with, I already knew. You come with the reputation. The, well, I already knew them. There was yeah. a degree of mutual respect and understanding, yeah. and it was more. Let's sit down. How are we going to work this out? Yeah. We we we're not the enemies. They are the enemies. We need to work this out for them because they're yeah. fuckwits. They yeah. can't work it out. And that's what we did. They got paid by their bloke. I get paid by my bloke. And we worked it out. Unfortunately, after we worked it out, my moron, who's a drunk, started ringing him saying, oh, your bicycle friends couldn't fucking help you, could they? <laughs> that's waving a red flag. But it took me another year. Yeah. I was up and down. <laughs> I got to imagine. It cost him a stack. But it was okay for me. Like, <laughs> Don't insult me. Yeah. Well, don't insult them. Because, yeah. you know, they're serious people as well. Like They, yeah. they were doing me a favour. We worked it out as gentlemen. And it, could, it can go either way. We can bang it on. They can bang it on. Did you did you see this as then uh, like a, a career path, uh, something where you're making money? And you said you're always looking for opportunities. But um, well, I couldn't understand. I couldn't. I couldn't believe the amount of money that was involved. Yeah, like it was insane amounts of money. We did stupid shit for a lot less. <laughs> <laughs> so I latched onto this team, and I hung onto them for the next ten years. Yeah. Uh, and it was great. It was a great ride in Darba for the mine. I'd be all over the world. Yeah, he he loved me. This guy, he had a lot of issues with not only with villains but also with uh, people in the industry. So then you know, it got to a stage where no one could communicate. There was allowed to call him. They had to call me, and right. I would decide whether I'm going to let you talk to him or not. Okay. And it was really good. So you would have learnt from someone on uh, well, I had, negotiating uh, and and seeing the the business level at that world. I had uh, his partner. Yeah. LK, he preferred not to be mentioned. Okay. He's a very cl- good friend of mine now. He's been, yeah. uh, I'll grow older, this guy. And he gave me a lot of direction. And, uh, you know, I have to be honest, a lot of the times he'd be telling me, rattling off stocks and amounts and this, and I just wouldn't fucking listen. And he'd be, <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. Clearly, it was a lot of opportunities. Yeah. But um, so he guided me a lot of the way. And uh, he that first job, he mediated the, um, he, he negotiated the result. He okay. said, he'll take care of it for you. What do you want to achieve? He goes, I just want to be left alone. Let's work it out in court. Okay, so this is what we want. Mm-hmm. And he kept half and I took half. And he paid very, very well. But what he paid was only, was less than 10% of what he what he got. Right. Because the company had about $170 million bucks in it. I wasn't paying attention. Big, yeah. Worse. Do you know what I did? Oh, my God. What? <laughs> After I resolved it, I flew straight to Sydney to the accountant. I said, oh, mate. Don't worry about that, man. It took me 10 minutes. Just give me a million. I walked away from 7 million shares. You dickhead. Exactly. <laughs> dickhead. Beat yourself up. Um, okay, so you, you, you're making some money there. Very good money by the sounds of it. It could have been a lot better if you weren't, were actually listening. Yeah. But um, you took the took the family over and uh, moved over to uh, Dubai? Yeah, well, we had problems with the schools. My girls were going to uh, Melbourne Girls Grammar and yep. uh, the teachers... I was in the media a lot. Not for anything I'd done other than being in a bike club. Yeah. And the mums, rightly so, were a bit concerned that they were going to get caught in some sort of crossfire. So they were yeah. rallying behind our backs to have our, our kids removed from the school. Yeah. And they were isolating our children and was That's getting hard. uncomfortable. Yeah. So I thought, you know, I can continue to do this and be selfish or throw the towel in, go away for a couple of years, come back and start again. Yeah. Yeah. So we opted for that. What was the lifestyle like over there? Bro. I was rolling hard in Victoria. I got whatever I wanted. Mm. You know, I get to Dubai, and I just didn't rate. <laughs> okay, so let, let's just what. So in in Victoria, everyone knows who you are. You, you got money in your pocket. Whatever you, you want. Yeah, lived well, drove well, 
respect, friends, restaurants, bars, whatever you want. You're right? a bi- big fish in a small pond. Correct. And then you've gone over there. Mate, did not rate. <laughs> Zero. Like, no one ever flinched in my direction, <laughs> which I didn't mind. Yeah. I wasn't there for that. But I'm saying the difference in life, I've gone from here to here. Yeah. It's like being incarcerated again. Right. I've okay. gone from a penthouse to cell. Not not exactly, but you know what I'm saying. So my um, life for me was okay because I still had my international shit going on. Yeah. We had international clubs. We started off Spain and we were in Sarajevo and other parts of the world. Um, and uh, so I was often traveling to Europe and I, I still enjoyed. You so know, you like you weren't a pauper. Your life wasn't no, you know, on wasn't. the bread line. No, no, no. We lived. I, I, I was fifty-five, so I'd accumulated a, a little bit of wealth yeah, over the yeah, years, yeah. and uh, we took it all over there with us. And plus, I mentioned that I only took one million shares. Yeah. But he put me on a contract, and he paid me very well for the next five years. Okay. So it made it all up. Then all my money was getting paid over there, so I had money over there sitting there as well. So it wasn't difficult, and I, I travelled a lot, London. Europe, Africa. Yeah, well, it's a good location for a central, lad, isn't it? Central. And the missus worked, and it was good. It you was were good. enjoying the lifestyle? Loved it. You just uh, need a lot of money. Yeah. You run out real quick. Can I bring up uh, Wayne Snyder? Absolutely. Okay. That Love was, Wayne. Um, what year was that? Uh, Probably uh, 13. Yeah. 14, 14, 15. 14. In Dubai. And he was at Hell's Angels. He was Hell's Angels. I met him in Dubai. He was living in Dubai. Yeah. Through a mutual friend. I knew Simon Main. Yeah. <laughs> he, um, he rang me and said, he gave me a story about Wayne. I'd never met him. And he gave him the same story about me. Right. J- just so we can meet. <laughs> uh, it worked. I met him a nice bloke. And we, we caught up now and then. But and he, you, you had, uh, like, uh, yeah, uh, the gangs can be uh, rivals, but you can look at an individual. In well, I, I was transparent. So right. I would I let the seniors know. Okay. That you know, you, you've I, seen I'm going to catch up with this bloke this yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sweet. I mean, so it was all good. I didn't, I didn't hide anything. I, okay. wasn't, I wasn't trying to be tricky or sneaky or trying to make friends with the opposition. Yeah, because uh, a lot of the guys didn't Up like front. Wayne. Yeah, yeah. For a long time, they wanted him dead. He survived all that. But, you know, so I met Wayne a few times, and he then he he migrated to Thailand, and yeah. uh, I was going to Thailand every now and then. We'd catch up, and he, I'd be the only comma with a bunch of Hell's Angels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but, he must have vouched for it. Oh, well, but he, he was the boss, so yeah. that, that, I'd be I'd be sitting next to him, and they can all fuck off. Yeah, right, that's the that attitude he had. We just liked each other. It wasn't based on anything other than personality. We didn't work together. He didn't need me. I didn't need him. Uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, just a friend friendship. Yeah, gen- genuine didn't, friendship, basically. Yeah, uh, it wasn't over a long period of time, so there wasn't much foundation there. But we, you know, we we clicked, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he knew you could trust me. Yeah, because I thought I could trust him, no doubt. Uh, yeah, there was some. I mean, I did some work in in Europe. It was from Switzerland, Germany, uh, Austria, and uh, it was a big recovery I was on. I needed help, uh, so I got onto the. I got through through uh, Wayne. I got onto the Angels, and they helped me with the job. And we they, did, they're in the area. Well, they the Germans. The Germans. The Angels are very strong right, in Germany. Okay. Yeah. So I was I was tracking this country down. He's very been very elusive and. I had fucking a team watching him for a while. Anyway, long story. But the angels stepped up and helped me in the solicitor's office. Where he was a trustee for a bloke. The bloke had transferred $16 million worth of wealth, and he decided to run off with it, effectively. Yeah. And we just got it back. Um, so, that, so that's the sort of relationship we had. And uh, so I had to go to Thailand for medical reasons. Yeah. And uh, obviously I called Wayne. I'm, he's, he lives in Thailand. We're going to catch up. And we did. We caught up for a few days. We stayed in a penthouse in Bangkok, and we trained. Had a few laughs, and uh, and it was it was from uh, that at that time when he uh, he disappeared or not disappeared well, he was murdered. What happened was he was very sober back then. Yeah, at that time, a third person joined us, and we had a penthouse, and then he got on the drugs. Yeah, got on the girls, and uh, next thing you know, Wayne and I have a bit of a crack. Yeah, now it's the next day. I get my results. I'm ready to leave. Yep. He didn't want me to leave, mate. He wanted me to go to Patea. Right. There's no way I was going to Patea. I've never been to Patea. Yeah. But I've heard about Patea. He wouldn't take no for an answer. What I didn't know then is he, he'd spotted that car two weeks earlier and he left Patea and he was in, I think, Koh Samui for two weeks. Yeah. Waiting for me to come. Not not to rescue him, but he was just waiting. Yeah. And uh, 
I didn't know that he'd seen that and he was a bit uncomfortable. Right, so a, a suspicious looking This car. is what I heard later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, says, I mean, I'm putting the pieces together myself. I don't know if it's if I'm on point or not. So yeah. it could be just fucking off with the fairies, to be honest with you. Yeah. But, but he would not, not let me go to Pataya. I had to go to Pataya, mate. So I went to Pataya. And uh, we were still partying. And I eventually went to sleep. And yeah. uh, shit happened. And that's he, he disappeared. And I think his body was found 24 hours later. Uh, yeah. But no. they knew where he was. They had the whole thing solved within... I assume the first day because there were trackers on the car. Did that cause? Uh, yeah, you you lost a mate, uh, obviously. But did it cause any dramas? You the fact that you're linked to the Comancheros and uh, you're hanging out with the Hell's Angel and and he disappeared. Like I, I'm sure there was speculation. <laughs> oh, but, so uh, much speculation. But yeah. I when I was I, I was arrested, obviously. Yeah. So I got onto the boys in Turkey, who was still the hierarchy, and told them the situation, and they said, "Oh, heavy shit." <laughs> <laughs> Good way of putting it. Yeah. Exactly, it's heavy, heavy duty, bro. I said, yeah. He goes, just hang in, hang in for a minute. So about six hours later, I get a, a phone call from an Asian guy. He says, put your hand up, which one are you? As I see this guy talking on the phone, I said, yeah. yeah. He goes, you're coming with me. I said, coming where? He goes, I've been told to take you to the airport and get you out of the country, right? Yeah. I said, I'm not going anywhere. He goes, no, no, I've been specifically told you have to go. I said, bro, I haven't done I've done nothing. My mate's missing. I'm not fucking bailing, mate. Can you imagine? Yeah. The fuck am I going to go? I'm, I'll wait for him to get back. I, we didn't know he was dead. We thought he, he might have been kidding. I actually thought he was downstairs and there was a basement. The yeah. day before I'd lost him, he was in the basement partying. I thought this whole time I was arrested, he was in the basement. Anyway, he wasn't, unfortunately. So I said, I'm not going to go. I'll stay. But you stay as well. I pay for you to stay until we till it's yeah, resolved. Yeah, so, so, so I booked a couple of rooms because the police would let me go to the hotel across the road for the night. But I was in the police station all day every day. Yeah. And then we waited for I think it was four or five days, and then they announced that he was passed. Yeah. And then I left. But they you were untesting me before I went. Right. <laughs> five days? Did you? I was sweet, get, bro. Okay. Well, you, I, don't, I don't know if you've been to Thailand now. It, it's over there. They got uh, all the. Uh, it's changed with uh, the drugs, uh, the grass, cannabis, yeah. and, and all that. They've set up cannabis stores right beside police stations. I don't know. I, I heard they were doing a backflip again, but uh, earlier on this year. Yeah, yeah I heard the same. Yeah, yeah no, I, I was in Thailand recently, and um, I was in a bar, and a guy came up to me, started talking to me. Yeah. Like, he was ex CIA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He'd retired. To Thailand because he had a, 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 a something wrong with his brain, a tumor in his right. brain, and this drug, and it's kept him alive and is is fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I, I was there this year and I I'd been to Thailand a, a bit, but I was just amazed that uh, yeah, kind of stores right beside police stations where yeah, a few years ago it would have been a completely different uh, different situation. Been doing twenty years. Yeah. Not, not good. We've had a couple of people here that have uh, done some time in uh, Thai prisons, and uh, mm. yeah, heavy, uh, heavy, heavy scene. Um, all right, now it's you've moved from Dubai. You've gone to Greece. I think from uh, my reading between the a book, you just want a little bit more freedom in uh, uh, than you had in Dubai. You've moved to over the Greece. Uh, look, Dubai was good. It was good for a minute. Yeah, but. Uh, you, you, you don't. I mean, it's it's funny enough. I mean, for a, a Islamic country, yeah, there's a freedom there you have that you don't have in Australia. But you have to behave. You cannot be offensive. Yeah. So for young children to bring up young children in that environment, it's brilliant. There's no offensive behaviour on television, on the, in the internet, in the street. No one cuddling and kissing. So the kids are, they're just kids. Yeah. They're let they're left alone to be children and grow into adults. So for that, it was amazing. But, you know, as an adult, we like to play up a little bit, and it did get a bit boring. So <laughs> so I migrated to Greece, where yeah. it's another to- another form of freedom again. Yeah. And, you know, a bit looser in uh, that's Greece. That's a lot of fun, bro. Yeah. yeah. I highly recommend it. Yeah. Go to Greece. No, I've been there. It's a good. Yeah. It's a very yeah. beautiful country. The beaches are amazing. The food's great. The people are really good. Yeah. And they don't tax you too much. Like, you go to Lebanon, they want the fucking lot. In Greece, they just want a clip. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, okay, so you, you're there. What you're still doing your consultancy? Yeah, stuff? yeah, I was still working Recovery for mining companies. Yeah, 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 I was doing a few things here and there. The things were drying out because the mining boom had ended. You went looking for a, a sunken treasure. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> black pearl. Fuck me. I uh, 
I was getting ready to buy the penthouse at the Burj Khalifa and turn one room into a vault. <laughs> I like the story. Like everyone in, once in their lifetime should start looking for some treasure. Well, they found treasure. The, the treasure's there. Yeah. There's no doubt about the gold being there. It's actually there. It's 60 metres below the water, uh, about 30 kilometres offshore in Ireland. Right. It's fucking there. All the documentation's there. It's, the ship's on its side. It's hard to locate. They got a, a mob out of America that had a laser that would cut the ship up because yeah. it was very difficult to enter it. And they spent about a million bucks. And I did all the... Uh, I started preparing for removing the gold off the ship with helicopters and flying them to Dubai. And you a, you a got team. some ex-special forces dudes. And, we all have to do yeah. special courses because it's the uh, that sea. If a helicopter goes down, you have to do a special course. We all yeah. did the fucking course. We had some Navy SEALs sitting in uh, Denmark, I think it was, for two weeks waiting to board this ship. Yeah. The ship was here. But the last million dollars didn't come through. Right. The whole thing fell over in the last minute. Bro. Yeah. I could be fucking loaded right now. <laughs> Oh well, at least you you you're gone for gone for your dreams. Yeah. Okay, the day of the uh the sorry the rain it in you could you could have been this now I'm going to take you to the uh the car car let's bombing. Go deep. Okay, let's uh let's go there. Tell us about that day that morning. Uh it's usual mate, just another day. Got up the kids, get the kids up ready for school. Yep. We had our routine. Get you were raising the kids on your own I had at this the kids, stage. I had the yep. kids for myself yep. in Greece. Uh and I loved it. Like I had a full-time living a person that would yeah. keep the house clean and cook the food and and if I needed to exit for 10 minutes there was someone there yeah right um, so it was great and I had the tutors and they went to a really good English speaking private school which wasn't expensive they had lunch together the kids were a community the whole school was a community it's unlike here bro like the kids all socialised with each other yeah there was no bullying none of that when my kids finally came back to Australia they were shocked they didn't know how to deal but um now they were loving life. The, we just had such a good time. But I dropped the ball. Yeah. I forgot who I was. Okay. I forgot yeah. who I pissed off. You you were you were Mr. Dad there. Just full enjoy, time dad. Bro. Enjoying enjoying life. I was followed for three days. I didn't even notice. Yeah. Can you imagine? No. Well, that, that is. I walk you, into you... I walk into a room. And I check all the exits. Look for weapons. Have a look. Quick look around. See who's there. I stopped doing all that. Yeah. I was just cleaning up after the kids, taking them to activities. <laughs> All right, yeah, we, I've got a sense of it. You, I thought you're a tough guy, but you turned into Mister Mum at this stage. And uh, but uh, it's 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 interesting because yeah, you've lived a life that you have got to be wary of uh, everything. You have got to be alert. You got to be vigilant. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh, a lot of people come unstuck when they do drop their guard. Yeah, yeah. but uh, not not in the form of getting blown up in a, a car bomb. But uh, continue con conti continue on. So um. You know, I dropped the kids to school and I went to the gym. Yeah. So I assume, and I, I don't know because it's never been confirmed, that they probably just put an explosive under the behind the wheel. Yeah. Because where I was parked, it was like a paddock. It was off the street. Anyone could have stopped beside me, just got yeah. out and rolled a little bit of an explosive and waited for me, then uh, yeah. re activated remotely, which was, uh, the police did say it was activated remotely. Because you, you were traveling with the kids in the car earlier on. I you? was. Yeah. I, I dropped the school. When I got to the school, I heard a fucking horrendous screech coming yep. from in front of the steering wheel. So I turned the car off quickly and panicked a little bit, thinking, what the fuck? Yeah. I go, I've never heard that sound. I'm not suggesting the bomb was there, but it was just enough. I'm just telling what ha what actually happened that morning. It doesn't make, it's not logical to think that they would make that sound. Yeah. But I heard that sound, and um, maybe they did put it there prior to that day. I don't mm. know, but it turned ahead. But obviously, yeah. I thought, oh, let's start carrying my bit. We'll pull that back out the safe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was that, that was the no, instant it, thought. Okay. And then I went about I went about training. Didn't give it another thought. But that's what happened. Okay. So. And then you uh, you come out. Come out of the car. I come out of the gym. Walk to my car. Open the door. Jump in. Both legs are in the car. And the door's still open. And the bomb goes off. So when the bomb went off, the airbag went off and pushed my head back into the seat. I didn't get knocked out. So I knew straight away it was an explosion. It had the, and you still had the door open. That's door probably, still open. That's probably why you're here talking. I'd now. say so. Yeah. 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 So the, the two things. Mercedes, they designed, well, I'm supposed a lot of cars up, but yeah. particularly Mercedes, that if you have a car accident, a head-on car accident, on impact, it's designed so the engine doesn't fly into you, yeah. that the energy is dispelled around you. Yeah. So this came from underneath where the engine was. The door was open. So the the pedals broke my feet. Yeah. But apart from that, you know, it's a bit of fire, a bit of burning. 
Nothing to brag about. All right, tough guy. <laughs> no, <laughs> seriously, I'm not even That's, joking, bro. But uh, yeah, it, there was significant uh, damage done uh, done to your uh, ankle. Which which one was it? Your, uh, My right one. Right. But it's not traumatizing yeah. damage. Like yeah. could have been a car accident. Yeah, true. Could have come off a bike. True. You know, a horse. Yeah, can't yeah. fall off horses and break their neck. So you you've got out, and I, the the way uh, the way you described it, you're worried about um, a, shooter. a shooter finishing you off, which mm. is you know if someone's trying to take you out, then you're still uh, alive. Um, the treatment that you got, it, it, you had uh, thought that you're going to lose your foot. Well, what happened was this is all going in real time for me. Yeah. I looked down when I noticed, when I realised my leg was so damaged. I thought straight away, let's cut that off. Yeah, you get one of those bionic feet, right? Yeah. Like I see, you see pictures of these soldiers with yeah. a bionic foot back in his kit, back at war. Yeah, I thought, I'll have one of them. All right, I'll be back at it and let's get on with it. Yeah, let's get these guns. All right, that's all I was thinking about. I mean, apart from there could be a shooter, but anyway, um, then when I went to the hospital, uh, the surgeon, he sort of. He did the first surgery, but it was more of like a patch up. Yeah. They didn't even bandage it properly. <laughs> I was still dripping and bleeding everywhere. And he, but he was a, a really good surgeon. <laughs> he came in and said, "Oh, you're going to lose your foot." And when he said it, it didn't sound it didn't sit right. I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "No." I said, "Why am I going to lose my fucking foot, bro? Like it's still there. It's just tape it back up." Yeah. Right. I put a couple of stitches. What, do what you got to do. He goes, "No, no. Look around you. This hospitals are more than a hundred years old. You're going to get an infection." I said, well, how, how are we going to improve that? I'm going to a private hospital for a start. Yeah. I'm out of here. And he also told me about another product you get from Germany. It's a, it's a bandage that helps uh, prevent infection. So I got that flown over from Germany. But when he heard I was going to a private hospital, he said, oh, I need to do one more surgery. Can you go tomorrow? I said, okay. So that following morning, he did a really good job. He straightened the leg up, put it all back together, bandaged it properly. So when I got to the private hospital, because his name's on it, I was okay, I was so. on point, bro. Yeah. So he did a really good job. I forget his name. I wish I'd known his name because he was such a good fucking surgeon. I should have actually chased that up. I'm a bit slack. So I get to the other hospital, and they do this other surgery, put on a fixator, and they made the legs looking good, right? They said, "No, we've saved it. You don't need any more surgeries. You're good." Okay. So, so you're feeling? I said, "I'm good." He goes, "You're good." He goes, "Can we talk about money?" I said, "Sure." I said. <laughs> What do you need? He goes, oh, can you give us cash? I said, absolutely. Right. How much do you want? He goes, oh, 10 or 15. I said, Joe, give him 15. It's the last surgery. He goes, last surgery. But that's it. Yeah, I said, give him 15 grand. Get out of the Euros. Cheap. Gave him 15,000 euros. And there's this other lady hanging around in the background. He's telling her to fuck off. She's admin for the hospital. <laughs> they want their bite too. I, I had no idea. <laughs> they wanted 30. Oh, shit. So we paid them their 30. Right? Yeah. And then the, the, the lady that puts you out, Anethesis. She's come in, starts arguing with me. No one's paid her. She's the most important one. I'm yeah, having well, surgeries well, every fucking second day, mate. Well, yeah. So how much? Anyway, I said, don't worry, I'll pay you directly. 500 euros each time, which was nothing, mate. So she was on the drip. Turns out I needed a lot more surgeries. Yeah. It cost me a fucking stack. But the initial surgery was good. And you uh, you got, well, I don't know, full use, but you... you Getting around, I'm, no, not, good, no, I'm not noticing it uh, as you, you came in. No, so, good as yeah, gold, bro. Yeah. Good as gold. Um, revenge? You know, revenge is sweet. Things work themselves out. We'll see how we go. Okay, don't say too much. I, I haven't <laughs> look, I haven't cautioned you. We're sitting here in eye catch. Bro, you got to know who did it I, for a start. I just, had to, I just had to say revenge. Trenched in the underworld. Yeah. I fucking know a lot of people. Yeah. And I didn't die, so maybe it was just a warning. Because he wanted me out, and I told him, no, you got to go. Now, <laughs> no, we had a bit of a dispute, yeah. and I had a contract, so, and he was getting paid, so he couldn't throw me out. But we had a problem. But he's the only person I had a problem with. Yeah. Maybe I was fucking the wrong woman. Well, I've, I've yeah, known a lot of uh, people that live the lifestyle you do, and uh, it's a dangerous lifestyle. And quite often I said, it's not the other baddies that's going to get you killed. We know what's going to, you've climbed over the wrong fence. And, well, mate, you yeah. just don't know. Because I tell you, if it was anyone in my world, they'd be bragging about it. Yeah, they'd be like, and they wouldn't let it. I mean, I've been here for five years. No one's had another crack. So, well, that, that's that's true. If they've had a had a go at you and the thought that you might find out, they'd uh, they'd, they'd come back. It, bro. Yeah, yeah. People I know don't fuck around. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't know. All right. Um, the book. 
You told me that, uh, and it doesn't fit with your tough guy image, but I think it's quite funny that you were writing the book um, before you uh, got the kids breakfast and took it to <laughs> school. That's when you're writing the book, the consultant. That's my quiet time. Like yeah. Five yeah. or six in the morning till seven, yeah. 7.30. I had some quiet time, so I'd bang it out on the computer, I'd take a modafinil, yeah. a couple of cups of coffee, and off I went. How'd you, how'd you find the experience writing it? No, it was good. I mean, I, it's really good. I, I didn't, it's, there's a lot more stories. Yeah, oh, I think you just scratch uh, scratch yeah. the surface. But there was enough content there. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, everyone's happy with it. What uh, what uh, gave you the inspiration to write the book? Greg Roberts. I was, I was wondering whether that would be the case. So when I he, he flew straight to Spain uh, to Greece, he spent he was looking for me for two days before he found me. <laughs> oh, after the bomb. <laughs> this is the kind of guy he is. But yeah. He finally found me, and we're sitting there. He's gone. You gotta watch these fucking reporters, bro. They're gonna write a book that they have done. Let me register your name so no one else can write it. <laughs> and then he goes, thinking. "Why don't you write a book? Could turn into something." Yeah. I mean, seriously, what are you gonna do for the next two years? Sit on your ass. So I did. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm I'm confident in a lot of areas, but you know, I'm not that articulate. Uh, but we, you know, we managed to do something that's mildly entertaining. Well, it's a, it's a, a, a good read, and I, I wouldn't give it a plug if I didn't uh, didn't enjoy it. But I said it to you before. I found it uh, found it interesting, and I got to say, it, it's raw in a way that uh, I sometimes don't see with true crime books. In that, it seems like okay, I get a sense of who you were when I read the read the book. I could pretty much go, okay, I know this know this person. So, I tried to get. We had a ghostwriter. Yeah. So I'd, I'd write it, and I'd expect him to rewrite it yeah. and make it give it some substance. Yeah. And he'd say, no, bro, it's got to stay in your voice. So he'd just do the spell check, effectively. Yeah. So it's all in my voice, and uh, you know, I really enjoyed the process. I think that makes it authentic when it, uh, it's – I can imagine you saying exactly the way, way it comes. I, yeah. I know when I, I did my uh, first book, the main thing was it's got to sound like me. Because yeah. otherwise, otherwise you, you don't want it to sound like someone else. You're reading it, and uh, uh, yeah. Life advice: you've you've been <laughs> you're still here, which is a miracle in itself. Yeah. What? How do How do you look back at your life? I have no regrets. Yeah. I regret nothing. I don't even regret the ten years jail. It's an experience. Like you know, I've been here for sixty. Ten was incarcerated. Met some interesting people. Did some push-ups. Read a book and went home. Like, you know, seriously, it's not okay, that bad. Can I write, I like that quote, uh, what, did 10 years, did some push-ups, read a book and went home. Yeah. Basically. Okay. I mean, like, you know, it all builds your character. Though. Mm. When you live in an environment where you get nothing and you have to fight to get what you get, and then you have to really fight to keep it. And you might have to stab one or two or you're at the risk of getting stabbed in iron bar daily. Yeah. It builds character. You either crumble or you step up. Okay, at the risk of um, yeah, pissing people off now, the the criminal world now, do you think it's easy to be a, a criminal in your day? Or? No, not at all. I mean, yeah. the hurdles they have, all the technology, the code is not what it used to be ethically. Like we knew growing up, we were often told, you, tell, you don't talk to police, you just don't. As yeah. a child, I was, I mean, we weren't even criminals. We were just, you just knew that. You just no comment. Uh, only because, not because you weren't telling on people, but because they fucking verbal you. Yeah. So if you get picked up, you just don't make a no comment statement. I, I, I hadn't thought of it that way, Jay, but I, I was going to agree with you on the fact that uh, I know my early days in, in policing, like I started in the 80s. So that's when uh, when I was there. It was old school. It was, yeah. If, and I said to you when you came in here and sat down, I said, uh, yeah, funny in, a, in an interview room and uh, I wouldn't even bother speaking to you and you said you'd tell me to get fucked and I think that's <laughs> pretty much, that's, yeah. that's pretty much how, how it would have so it how it yeah. played out. But it has changed now and uh, I think policing has got to, it's still, from a police point of view, it's a tough job, but they've got advantages now with all the technology. Technology, DNA technology. I mean, but look, the, the policing has, has evolved, but so are the criminals. Like, yeah. Like these guys, you have to be really sharp to kick on, yeah, and yeah. to stay successful. You have to be really, really sharp, and you have to be really, really willing, and have all the technologies that they have that they can afford, and just stay ahead of the game. Yeah, some some can, and some can't. But it's always changing, and and we yeah we talked about the uh, a norm the uh, the uh, telephone network. Oh, anom, yeah, Jeez. yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah, that that was like. Whew. 
Thank fuck I didn't have one. I, I got to say, I was out of the cops when it happened, but when it happened, I thought, what a brilliant plan from the cops' point of view. <laughs> and uh, It's a brilliant plan, but I mean, you just don't know if it's going to stick really because, like, I know they're fighting, uh, fighting. So they should, because yeah. um, it's like it's a yeah, you're behind a wall. Yeah. How can you identify that person to that to that to that uh, device? Yeah, yeah. Like you, you could have the wrong person. Well, tech, uh, technology. I'd uh, yeah, old school days of uh, sitting there and uh, of, yeah, thinking no one's watching you or listening. It's uh, they're watching everything. Change. Well, you walk out in the street, they can pretty well uh, chase. These things here, they can activate them, listen to us. They yeah. could be doing their own podcast while you're doing a podcast. <laughs> well, if you're doing your podcast, you should release it first. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think you know my my history, but this thing is a thing that got me out of the cops because I recorded the conversation on the phone. Oh, you said that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, it's uh, say technology and me. It never, Look, never go down well. It's going to be tough to be a crook in this day and age. I, I think so. I, I genuinely think so. And I think it's uh, a, a hard world to go down if you want to. You can go in for the excitement and all that, but you've accepted, you accepted, okay, I did 10 years. A lot of people, that would break them. Um, yeah. yeah, they're weak ones. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look, the thing. Let me tell you something about Australia, mate. Okay. That's what it is. All right. Well, uh, stay stay alive and enjoy life. Do our best. Cheers. Thank you. Yep. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'll 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 weave this in. Jay, one thing, and uh, you you've seen done a lot. Um, I get the sense that uh, yeah. I, I called you hard ass at the start. Is there anything you fear? Anything or anyone? Because there's a lot of hectic people out there. Well, so, give us both. Like, it's, well, there's no one in particular, but like I, you know, I don't think I've got any enemies. Yeah. So I should not have any fear. Yeah. But there's definitely a lot of formidable characters out there. Yeah. Like, there's no shortage of very willing hectic people that will fucking kill you. Okay, so you give give that uh, give that respect. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You can't go around poking the bear, bro. <laughs> <laughs> what about your mum? I reckon she... <laughs> oh, well, unfortunately, sadly, she's passed, but I definitely feared her. Yeah, okay. She was hard, bro. Yeah, I reckon she would have had to be to keep you lot in, in line. Can I tell you when we were in court? Yeah. The policeman, like, I got arrested there too. Yeah. It's a land of opportunity. Yeah. You can do very well here. Just yeah. going to be a little bit driven, a little bit creative, and work hard. Yeah. Like, so many people are successful just from that. Just they work, don't work, need to work. break the law. You don't need to worry about getting raided. Yeah. There are opportunities everywhere. Yeah. Just find them. Well, I, uh, I I think we'll uh, we'll finish up on that. But look, I've, I've really enjoyed the chat. And I, I've liked how you've been up front. And uh, I predicted it before uh, before you came on and when we had the chat. I, I didn't think there'd be uh, any bullshit or dressing it up. You are who you are. Mm. I respect you know, people that live by a moral code, even if I don't agree with the code. Fair one enough. one thing I, I don't like, Jay, and I, I think you attested this too, is uh, hypocrites. I hate people pretending to be something that they're not. And you, yeah. you've raised it a couple of times, tough guys that are not really tough. You want to know what it's like sitting down, speaking to a real hard ass? Well, I think you uh, found that out today. He's the type of person I understood. I understood when I was in the, in the cops. There's something I like about a person that lives by a moral code. It might be a moral code that I don't necessarily agree with. But I respect someone that's um, true to himself. And uh, what I find with uh, Jay is that uh, he owns what he's done. Um, I was worried the fact that uh, he was dealing in heroin, but we addressed that uh, during the, the talk that he now appreciates the uh, the dramas that can cause to it cause to a lot of people. He doesn't take a backward step. He's a tough guy, let's face it. Um, but he gave us a real insight into the world that he inhabited. And uh, I think that's where I wanted to take the listeners. And uh, Jay certainly did that with us today. Yeah.